Well, it shook it up. Uh, slavery requires uh, the support of government. It requires enforcement. It's something that uh, when a disruption occurs in a society, it's very difficult to, to have a slave system such as they had in, in, uh, in America, in, in Virginia, Maryland, and South Carolina at the time of the American Revolution. And so when there's any sort of civil disorder and discord, that, that shakes the system. And it also disrupted it even more profoundly when you had armies moving through, when you had, uh, you know, as in Virginia, when the royal governor uh, pulled out of the, the uh, uh, capital of the colony out of Williamsburg. And uh, so suddenly you have this situation where there's uh, sort of no government or an interlude in it. And so it shook the institution up and it allowed uh, slaves fled from masters in many cases. It, uh, um, it, 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 it changed it in, in a good many ways. Well, you know, it was a difficult decision for them. Uh, you know, they had their masters who weren't promising them very much uh, freedom. And the British, uh, the British, on the British Isles, and, and slaves were aware of this because remember there's a network of communication that carries over from off of shipboards, people carrying back and forth. In 1773, the British had outlawed slavery in the British Isles, although they still had a very harsh form of slavery in the West Indies, in Jamaica and their other sugar islands. So it was a difficult kind of um, decision to make, whether you would go with this. And a number did go, you know, they went with, uh, with Dunmore and, uh, and joined his, his cause. Others chose not to because they, they had ties. Remember that it, slavery is, is different here in America because uh, the slaves have communities, they have families, they have many kin, they're born here too. So for, for many of these people it would mean perhaps leaving all that you knew and all that you loved and so uh, they might choose to stay. So it was a difficult decision for them, but some did join, uh, join, join Lord, Lord Dunmore and fought for him in uh, uh, a little engagement that he had down in, in eastern Virginia. Lawrence originally wanted to use 5,000 uh, slaves. Lawrence, very prominent son of a very prominent planter. In, uh, in South Carolina, one of the wealthiest and, and uh, richest in, uh, uh, in, in South Carolina, a rice planter. He's a young man, very well educated, uh, absorbed the ideas of, the, of the, the Enlightenment, a very brave and courageous officer. He fought at Brandywine and Monmouth and the actions of the, of the, uh, of the revolution. It was said of him that uh, uh, one of the officers said that, that uh, if he's not shot, if he's not, if he's not shot dead, it's not because he didn't try, you know, he was doing everything, uh, that he was very bold. And so he drew up a proposal to arm and uh, use 5,000 slaves with the promise of freedom. And he was supported by Alexander Hamilton and others in the Continental Army. They thought this was a good idea. Uh, he thought that it was a way for, for South Carolina in particular to uh, defend itself against the British, that without that they might have real problems in terms of raising the, the necessary manpower. Um, but the, the problem was is that immediately George Washington saw was that it would frighten the big slaveholders. They would think that it would lead on to slave revolts, um, that, they, that it would cause them to perhaps pull back from support of the patriot cause. And so Washington urged caution and Lawrence went back to South Carolina. He scaled the proposal back to 3,000, but he was, uh, he was fought by the governor of South Carolina and others uh, in the legislature for those reasons, that it might cause a uh, slave revolt, that it would upset the slave system. And so ultimately, it did not come to pass. It is one of the, 
the great might have been of the American Revolution because had those numbers fall, had a process happen like that and they had been given freedom, very possibly that could have begun the unraveling of slavery. Initially, I mean, they were, they were right there from the beginning at Bunker Hill and, uh, and in some of the agitation leading up to uh, uh, the revolution itself. Um, and so they initially uh, enlisted in, in the Continental Army. And George Washington, perhaps at the urging of some of the other Southern officers, uh, banned their use. Then he rescinded the order, and he would never reimpose it because he found them to be good soldiers. Unlike in later wars, uh, they fought next to white soldiers. Uh, there was a regiment that was almost all black of free blacks from Rhode Island who fought, but it wasn't completely black. And in other regiments, they fought right with other soldiers. There were instances in which, uh, like for example, in Pennsylvania, uh, they offered a, a bounty to slaveholders that if they would enlist a slave, the slave would get freedom, and then the slaveholder would get a grant of land to compensate them for that slave's freedom. So there were some who did enlist with this idea of, uh, of gaining freedom. And the idea that um, they, what did they support the, the ideals of the revolution? I think so. I mean, I think that uh, like, the, like other Americans, like everybody else, they, they, the ideas of the Declaration were what moved them. And so uh, that, that that would apply to them was an idea that was very appealing, I think. I don't think they were naive. They knew that it, that, uh, it, was, it would be difficult, that masters were uh, skeptical of doing this and that it wouldn't be easy to do. But I think that uh, there were, they believed in that, that cause. Well, large numbers uh, in, in, uh, uh, in Virginia, we're not quite sure how many, you know, it's, it's difficult. This is before the age of computers and before people kept exact records. Uh, Thomas Jefferson estimated that 30,000 slaves uh, fled to the British uh, or were taken by the British. It was hard to say because uh, of course, Lord Dunmore initially issued his proclamation. And then the British Army and the British raided under Benedict Arnold initially, and then under Lord Cornwallis, came into Virginia. And so uh, slaves fled to uh, the British uh, Army. Uh, the ones who had uh, uh, fled to uh, Cornwallis and to Dunmore were uh, most of them died from smallpox. They had, you know, of course, they were quarantined onto Gwen's Island, a little island in the Chesapeake with uh, Lord Dunmore, close uh, uh, confinement with each other and with sailors and soldiers. And many of them died of, uh, of smallpox. Those who had accompanied uh, Cornwallis's army because his army moved through the Carolinas and into Virginia. And so he ac uh, accumulated a number of slaves who had fled to his army seeking freedom. And by the time he reaches Yorktown, he has them there. And of course, he has no provisions to, to feed them. And so he, he turns them loose into the wilds. And so um, a number of them die from smallpox or, or hunger. And uh, we have some very um, poignant descriptions by some of the Continental Ar Army officers and others who found them in the condition that they were in and that sort of thing. So it was, it was hard. South Carolina, uh, the total population there, it's, it's interesting. The best, the best uh, uh, take we can get is that at the time of the revolution, about 60% of the population was uh, enslaved. By the end of the revolution, the best count that we can get is about 43%. So again, it's a place where perhaps as many as 30,000 slaves fled, fled to uh, the British. They occupied large parts of South Carolina for several years, Charleston and some of the uh, upcountry. And so uh, when they pulled out of Charleston and they pulled out of New York because there were also uh, uh, slaves that had fled to the British there, they took uh, the slaves with them. And they settled some in uh, Nova Scotia 
Uh, and then they, others, of course, were totally betrayed and, and sold into slavery into the West Indies. And it was, a, it was a mixed result. Others were taken back to Britain and freed. And others, those from uh, Nova Scotia, many of them ended up in Sierra Leone on the west coast of Africa, and which started a, a colony there for these people, these American uh, slaves who had fled to the British. So it was a very difficult uh, path that many of these people followed, and it was a fatal one for many of them, mostly through disease. Well, it changed things because remember, it, it's oftentimes masters might be away serving with the militia or with the Continental Army. Uh, it also, even the ones who were there, had to think about um, whether their slaves would run away. So to some extent, it loosened the system. It perhaps gave the slaves a little more autonomy uh, that we'll see. We'll see that they had already by this time formed slave communities. Uh, they had kinship and families, but they also had communities. And so within that, um, they perhaps gained a good bit more autonomy uh, during the time of the American Revolution. There are, there are so many things that are going on. Uh, among the whites, of course, the, the idea is growing um, uh, that, that slavery is uh, not, not a good thing. It's something that should, that's immoral, it should be ended. And among the slaves, what we're finding is that uh, they're finding areas of greater autonomy. And so the revolution is going to speed up both of those, uh, both those things. And it will start the process that will lead to um, the, the ending of slavery in the Civil War. I mean, what's going to happen, of course, is that the economics of it at the time of the revolution, which were substantial in the Chesapeake and in, and in uh, South Carolina and Georgia and the rice country, that's going to become enormous. That becomes, uh, in the 19th century, with the growing of cotton and with the Industrial Revolution, that becomes, for several decades, the single biggest American product. And the investment in slaves and capital becomes huge. And so the economics of slavery by the 19th century become very difficult. Uh, the idea of ending it is much more difficult than at the end of the American Revolution. Well, the, the, the Continental Congress, and it called itself that until 1781, the Second Continental Congress, uh, banned uh, the slave trade right off. Of course, Virginia, remember Virginia and Maryland wanted to do that anyway at the time. That was one of the complaints that Jefferson included in the Declaration of Independence, that, uh, that King George III wouldn't allow uh, the colonists to stop this terrible trade in human beings. But the... But the uh, uh, the members of the Continental Congress uh, struck that from his draft. Remember, South Carolina and Georgia, the slave systems there in rice and indigo were really beginning to thrive, and they wanted that slave trade to be open. And as Jefferson himself noted, there were also people in Rhode Island and Massachusetts that were shippers that were involved in that. So uh, the fact that they adopted a, a ban on the slave trade is significant in the face of, of that kind of criticism. The Confederation Congress, it became the Confederation Congress by 1781 with the adoption of the Articles of Confederation. And what they, their, their big uh, uh, item that they had to deal with, really two involving slavery. One was its expansion into the Western Territory, the, the territory west of the Allegheny Mountains. And the other one was the slave trade. And so they dealt with that first issue, and they dealt with it first in 1784 by a proposal from Thomas Jefferson that they ban slavery in all of those lands west of the Alleghenies. And it failed by one vote, as Jefferson said. You know, the fate of the world hinged on but one person, and that was silent, you know. And so after Jefferson leaves and goes to France, the, uh, the Confederation Congress does adopt the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 that bans slavery north of the Ohio River. But what it does do, it also adopts the Southwest Ordinance, which allows slavery into those areas south of the river. And so it doesn't really end it, and it will start this, this, uh, this cut between the northern states and the southern states. It will continue that, that it already started 
along the Atlantic seaboard and carry it further. The other thing was that they, they, didn't, they didn't address um, the slave trade again. One, they don't want to address it directly. They don't want to address slavery directly. Uh, remember, we're, we're saying that slavery is something people are questioning. So you'll find that in the actual document itself, they do not use the phrase, although quite clearly a number of clauses in the Constitution refer to slaves. They had uh, some very strong debates at times over some of the issues, particularly the slave trade. And so in the end, they compromise on the slave trade. They give it a 20-year window of time, from the time of the 1788 until 1808, uh, before it can be ended. And it is, in fact, ended in 1808. The other uh, questions are uh, dealing with how to count, because you're going to have, you know, there were a number of different compromises that are adopted in the Constitution on how to uh, form, uh, how to apportion representation between the states in the legislative branch of the government. And uh, in the, of course, the Senate, each, each state would be allocated to senators. But in the House of Representatives, you would be based upon population. And so you count the whole number of persons living in the, um, in the state. And so uh, how do you count slaves? And uh, for the purposes of taxation and for representation, they settled upon uh, three-fifths, counting each one of them as three-fifths of a person. Uh, it wasn't really meant that they thought that that had any relationship to their human value. It was a formula that had been used back in the Confederation days to apportion taxation. And so that's where they got the, the concept from. It was uh, uh, actually something of a concession, ironically enough, to the northern states rather than the southern ones because had they been counted as a whole person, those states would have had even greater representation in the, in the legislature. In the Chesapeake region, We've got this problem of uh, planters uh, who don't, are not comfortable with slavery anymore. And it's, it's not particularly financially profitable, but they have a, a huge stake in it. They have a huge capital stake in it. And the thing that's even more profound is they don't know how they would deal with this 40 or 50 percent of their population of African Americans that had been held in, in bondage. How would you have them as citizens? In the, as you go farther south, as you get to South Carolina and Georgia, you find that the slave system there, the rice system and indigo and what's called Sea Island cotton, is a thriving system. Those slaveholders won't want more slaves, and uh, they're, they're ready to, to hold on to the institution. And so uh, to have gotten rid of it, to have tried to end it at the time of the, of the Constitutional Convention probably would have meant that you, you sank any kind of agreement that was possible. So again, extremely difficult. It's not, uh, though, though slavery is not as strong as it will later become in American history, it's a bit controversial because there are, uh, there are people who contend that that was the one moment before the American Civil War at which slavery might have been abolished. And there is there's a case that can be made for that. But I think in the end, uh, if they wanted to have a, a nation united, and that was their key goal, was to create a United States of America. To do that, they had those five states where slavery, that were slave societies. And so, and they were a very important part of the, the new union. In fact, Virginia was the single largest state in the Union. And so that was the, the difficulty that they faced. It's, a, it's sad, true, uh, you know, would that they could have ended slavery at the time. Uh, I think, though, given the political constraints they were under and with the fact that the paramount issue was creating a United States of America, even though probably the majority of people at the Constitutional Convention were uneasy with slavery, and had you done a poll, I very much suspect that Perhaps a majority of the 55 present 
would have said, let's get rid of slavery. Nevertheless, I think they had to make the compromise that, that they made. 